much. I appreciate you everybody's time this afternoon. Uh, I want to talk about a, a particularly uh, interesting topic, at least to some of us, to, to, to myself and to uh, some on this call, I'm sure. And that is, um, uh, well, but first let me introduce myself a little bit more. I've been with Autodesk for about seven years, but I've been doing PLM for a lot longer than that. And, uh, you know, there, there, there's always the, the justification that you kind of need to go through for PLM. And PLM is a little different than a lot of software uh, products, even that even that Autodesk sells, it, it's it's so, it's an outlier in, of sorts. In that, uh, you know, it's it's not a product, it's not a personal productivity tool. It, it's really more of a um, an organizational optimization tool. And so what that means is everybody's going to give a little bit to get a big uh, return uh, on the back end. And so. Um, I want to go through a process of sort of how we uh, try to estimate that, and then so that you can, um, you know, justify the the case or, or make make a case and justify the expense of, of a PLM system. So with that, I'll move along first. And you might be asking yourself, uh, you know, what is a PLM? So I'm going to address that shortly, and then we'll go into measuring its value and how that uh, how that ROI calculation works probably a little bit differently than maybe you would for uh, some other uh, business type investments. Uh, at, at the end, we'll talk about, you know, how can I get started? What, how can, I'm gonna be showing you some tools and uh, you have, uh, you, you can get access to those tools. And I'll talk about how to engage on that, and how to get access to those tools. And then we'll just take some uh, Q and A time and uh, hope just to have a conversation, uh, you know, uh, I can, uh, Talk about uh, past times when I work with other customers to, to do the uh, calculations or, or or whatever questions are on your mind. But first, you know what is PLM? I, I feel like I kind of need to introduce this just in case there's someone uh, coming on for the uh, sort of investment aspect of uh, of, of what I'm going to be saying and and the the justification aspect because in a lot of ways the tools and the and the techniques that I'll talk about here. Uh, they, they work as well for PLM as, as they do for other products, uh, uh, other especially enterprise products that you would make a business investment in. And so let's let's just talk about PLM for a moment. What uh, you're seeing on the screen here is what I call the messy slide. Uh, to, to some degree, uh, most all customers that uh, I walk into, this, this is the picture of how they start out. And if you squint your eyes a little bit and, and, and look closely, you'll see things like uh, documents, like PDF documents flying around there and uh, emails and Word documents. There's a lot of Outlook. Uh, and, it's, and so we have all of this data flying around our organization between different departments, such as uh, engineering, manufacturing, quality, procurement, and so on. And what we really need to do is, or, or what, what PLM offers as a value, like I said, in terms of optimizing the, the organization is in eliminating a lot of those uh, paths, the, the red arrows that mark movement. But anytime we're optimizing a process, movement is an enemy. And, uh, and even if it's an electronic movement of data from one person's desk to another person's desk, that, that, that's, uh, that, that's something that we'd like to avoid or at least minimize. And so a lot of the value of PLM comes from the ability to reduce the picture, to uh, simplify the picture into something that might look more like just communications between departments. And so this is what we're after. This is what we're trying to, uh, uh, you know, to try, try to reduce to. Um, and I would say that we have kind of a unique uh, cloud solution that all of these different uh, departments or organizations could be spread across multiple uh, locations and facilities. And, and so that complicates the, the, the movement or it makes the, you know, the cost of a movement even more expensive. And so again, to the degree that we can minimize those, that's what we're trying to do. Let's, let's talk about why people buy PLMs. Obviously it's to optimize processes, but Let's talk about uh, why to make the investment. The primary reason that we find that our customers uh, are interested in a PLM is because they're trying to get to market faster. So what they're really trying to do, that the outcomes that they're, uh, that they're trying to achieve are to improve collaboration, 
to increase product development agility. And that might mean, you know, it might be an increase of instead of 10 products a year, I can reduce, I can produce 12 products per year. And that might sound like a small uh, increase, but you, you just think about what you could do if you could uh, eliminate uh, some of the time on every product that you're working on to produce more products. So that probably uh, uh, goes to the top line, it goes to sales. And then uh, PLM also has a lot to do with efficiency, which allows that top line money to drop to the bottom. So to improve, improve profits. So uh, increasing product development agility and improving supply chain agility, those have a direct impact both on revenue and on profit. Uh, we talk a lot about reducing non-value added processes. And by these, I mean all of those, uh, all of those tasks that take somebody say in the engineering department, take them away from doing engineering things, things that require engineering expertise to do. So, uh, you know, having, having unnecessary meetings, uh, doing uh, searching for data that's hard to find, uh, making those kinds of correlations, uh, th those are what I might characterize as non-value added processes. So it's kind of a, a, a long-winded term, but the idea is just uh, efficiency, just re re making everybody more efficient. And lastly, reducing defects and non-conformities. So defects and non-conformities are sort of the ultimate time wasters. You know, so if we can reduce the numbers of those, then we can uh, improve our efficiency as well. Now, if you're trying to make a case for uh, for purchasing, you're, you're probably at one of two levels. You're pro probably going to be a super user who who wants the department to work to work uh, more efficiently within itself. But you might also be uh, an executive sponsor who is trying to uh, improve the efficiency of the entire organization. And sometimes th that uh, department head needs to make a case to the executives just to get the money allocated, for instance, for during the budget cycles or whatnot. So when would you do a, an ROI analysis to try to, 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 try to, uh, to uh, start moving toward a purchase of a PLM system? And so my, my answer to that is early in the process, start as soon as challenges are identified. And, and what you can start to do very early is develop uh, the list of metrics that you would use to quantify the problems. Um, you, you would also uh, perform some some level of ROI analysis as part of a solution development, uh, possibly as you, as the uh, as you're evolving your solution and evaluating and deploying uh, products like, like ours. Um, you would also do it uh, and reconsider as your business changes. So. Uh, for instance, if there are compelling events or compelling uh, things that you need to accomplish in the next three, six, nine months, five years, well, whenever those goals change, you ought to reconsider your uh, the, the analysis that you do that goes into any kind of investments, such as a PLM system. Uh, as part of the solution deployment is, a, is another good time. So once you get to the point where you think you've got a solution, let, let's go back and validate that the value that you predicted is what you're actually getting. And then also, you know, just putting a new system in place can change dynamics and, and uh, around your whole organization. So, so that some of the assumptions that you made early on might not be the same moving forward. So be deliberate and, and, and look holistically at the business problem as, as far as, uh, justifying the return on investment that you think you'll pay. Next, let, let's just talk about how do we start out? How do we start out doing an ROI analysis? And the thing uh, that, that you want to do first is identify what we might call value drivers. So uh, we, we've done some studies at Autodesk and, and some of these are taken out of the general literature as well, but we feel like these four uh, value drivers labeled product creation, business growth, operational efficiency, and enabling innovation, we feel like those four are the drivers that most resonate with small, small to medium and large uh, uh, manufacturing companies. 
And then, so you kind of read the descriptions there uh, about what each one of those things mean, but I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail I'm about to step in uh, to the product. And I have just a few slides of, of what the tool looks like that we're gonna be talking about. I primarily include them here so that when you get a, uh, uh, if you get a copy of this presentation uh, that you can see what it is without having to go into the system. So I just wanted to have these here for record, but let me talk, talk about a few of the screens that we're gonna look at. This first screen, you'll notice that right across the top, it has the, um, the business growth, the operational efficiency, product creation. So these were the drivers that were on that last slide and, and, and they have definitions behind them. I had the short version of the definitions on that previous slide. In the system, there's actually longer definitions and, and uh, you, you can use those when you actually access the system. So I'll come back to those in a moment. Next, we have, uh, we'll, we're gonna be quantifying outcomes. And the way we do that is through a set of formulas. And these formulas are in this smart document. And the, do the document appears uh, here on the right side. Uh, you can see there are blue numbers and there are black numbers. And the blue numbers, you can click on them and dive into those. Uh, those could be calculations in themselves. And what you're seeing on this page is just the result of that calculation. Or they could just be simple numbers that represent an assumption that you've made about your current business. Another uh, kind of page that we'll look at is, uh, is an assumptions page. And this, for instance, looks at some processes labeled A through H on the left side there. Uh, and the numbers of hours and the numbers of users in a couple different modes of, of operation. You, you can see there's an author, uh, author and view uh, column, but there's also a view only column. And so what we can do is we can say for a sales RFQ process, uh, I, I want to get into the system, how many uh, users might I have doing that process and for, for how long each day or per week. And uh, then the other uh, common assumption there is, is um, are, are the numbers of users at those times. That's another page that uh, we'll look at in the system. And lastly, I just want to uh, show you what some of the outputs. Uh, at, the, at the end of the process, you have a choice here on the left side uh, of the kinds of outputs that you can get. And they're anything from a very detailed uh, sort of textual document uh, that would come out in a PDF, or you can get, uh, I like this one page, uh, one pager PowerPoint that gives you basically what's, what's shown in this uh, chart here on the right. And with that, I'm going to go into the demonstration and show you that live. But like I said, I just wanted to introduce it um, so, so that if it gets separated, you can still uh, talk about it. So I am going to bring this down here. And I apologize, I need to move a few things around on my screen. Um, actually, before I start there, any, any uh, questions about that, uh, that overview, the, the start of it? I have the questions list here on my desktop. So if things come up, I'll try to keep an eye on that. And uh, Ashley will help me as well. Is there an audio problem? I should check on that. I just now noticed that uh, Greg had asked about uh, audio. I'm not really picking it up. Okay. Yeah, you're good, Fred. Okay, we'll go on then. So like I said, the the this is where we're going to start. We're going to start from the uh, drivers, the business drivers, and each one of these has a different set of uh, measurements or metrics down below. So when I'm working on business growth, I'm going to be talking about improving profitability by avoiding costs from displaced systems. So if systems go away, that might save you some money. Uh, uh, you, you can reduce the numbers of change orders or reduced operating costs, costs like uh, scrap and uh, overtime and, and things like that. We'll go into the more detailed definitions of these, but I just want you to see how the page is structured. When I'm sitting on those, these are the measurements that I'll be interested in. And at any given, at any time, I can turn these off or on because I just, maybe I want to just focus myself. I just want to center 
on one specific metric. So turning those on and off is useful. Uh, if I go to the next driver, enabling uh, innovation, you can see here the metrics that I'll be uh, looking at are sales RFQ response. And this is really primarily uh, around uh, reducing the non-value added uh, tasks or, or things that happen during a sales RFQ process. Uh, same way with items and bonds management. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll come back to that. Items and bonds management and, uh, and change management. You can see there's, there's a couple more below. So each one of these value drivers has a different set of, of metrics. They all work kind of the same way. I can turn on, on or off an entire uh, metric or uh, value driver. For instance, this uh, product creation right now, based on my current assumptions that are in the, in the sheet, that I'll show you in a moment. Uh, but based on those, I can turn the entire thing off just by, question, by turning off the, or clicking on the uh, circle, the percentage there. And that turns off this one, so I can focus maybe just on these others. Uh, the, the, the other piece of information that's on this screen is a summary of what do all these things add up to. If I, uh, if I clicked on the second operational efficiency, you'll see the value go down by $98,000. Oops, sorry, I missed it. There we go. Go down, go down by $98,000. So, so this summary number is, is basically just adding up these that have not been turned off. Okay, just as each one of these uh, the, uh, individual value drivers are looking at just the values that have not been turned off below. Okay. Let, let's go into the assumptions page. And uh, there's sort of two levels of assumptions we can make. And it's, it's, it's useful to start out at a, the highest level or a higher level of assumptions. So, uh, and there, there's all assumptions. I'll show you all of the, all assumptions in just a moment. But at this level, you can see if I scroll down, there's perhaps a dozen uh, values here that we can modify and, and adjust. And this might be just how we start out. Of course, if we zero everything out, that would give you an, an empty sheet to, to just start over and, and try again. Uh, and I can zero them out just by clicking on them and entering a number. So now I have zero here on item and bomb management, zero users. Uh, but, but roughly, you know, this center part of the page is about the size of your teams. And so if you can quantify how many people uh, you have working on, uh, on each of these processes, then it's an easy thing to, to come in and enter these values. That there are other kinds of numbers uh, that, that I won't go into right now, but uh, there are other ways uh, besides just saving a rate, you know, a, a pay rate for a certain number of hours. Uh, there are other numbers uh, that might be in the system, such as uh, the cost to have it of a duplicate part in your system, in your environment, um, how many parts you manage, uh, maybe the average time to market of, uh, of either your products or your uh, or projects in the case of uh, if you're an engineer to order type of company that this might be uh, uh, interpreted as a project instead of as a product. I think there are yeah there's a couple of numbers like that up at the top too. How, how many uh, how many products are you releasing each year and, uh, and 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 what's the what's the cost or what's the annual revenue? I'm sorry, our annual revenue of producing one of those. Now, obviously these are broad generalizations, very high. Uh, uh, estimates. Uh, you want to be conservative when you as you start, and then try to justify moving them off of the conservative numbers as you as you progress and and this ROI matures. What's your annual company growth rate? We don't want to overlook that. We, if we want to uh, to to grow at 3.5 percent uh, next year, let's use that as an assumption as far as what's going into the. Uh, uh, the financial analysis, and I'll show you some other financial numbers that we can adjust later. So assumptions are kind of the uh, the high level numbers. I'm sorry, key assumptions. If I look at all, I'm just going to show you that there's more numbers. There's more numbers you can change. You can see some of them are the same. Some of these that are uh, in bold blue, uh, they're the same numbers that were on the previous sheet. It's just that now they're broken out with also with hours spent doing things. So it's it's a little bit of just how this sheet is organized, uh, but you can see uh, a good number of other numbers down below. Now, some of these numbers, they only show up in one or two calculations. So 
you, you could start out on the key assumptions and then go figure out what's uh, contributing the most to the benefits. And the benefits pages were what we were looking at before. So you can kind of start out by answering just sort of a minimum li list of assumptions. But as you get deeper into these calculations, you'll have an opportunity again to, to, uh, to modify the numbers. Um, let's go to the investment page just briefly. And, and you know, this is an ROI analysis, right? So R is for return. That's the benefit that you, could, that you would get from the system if you deployed it. But you also, in order to do an ROI, you also have to have the I, the investment part. How much money are you going to spend to get all that benefit? And, and the, the investment part of it is really pretty straightforward. It's really only this one page. So on the investment side, we can just estimate the hardware expenses uh, or, or, and the software, the maintenance, consulting, and if, if you need another number, and you estimate it over uh, three successive years. Now, this kind of pattern or, or illustration that I'm running right here is uh, might, might be for a cloud solution, which happens to be what our PLM solution is. And, and so you're going to, uh, invest in software subscriptions each year at, at some cost level. And but the first year, you'll probably have some consulting uh, fees to, to deploy the system. So this kind of pattern that has software every year, but consulting, uh, and, and it may be also in the second year, but let's, let's say we spent $5,000 that year. So you might have a pattern that's kind of like this. So it goes down over time as you get the deployment into place and you're using the system and, and it's satisfying your requirements and you're not changing the scope of the system, then you would see this kind of pattern over time. Uh, maintenance, uh, so, some software is sold as, uh, as maintenance. Uh, you know, it's just a different pattern of payment. And on the hardware side, since our product is in the cloud, there is no hardware. So this, this would be a case of what I'd want to pair this with is, uh, is I might be removing or replacing systems that, you know, that are my current hardware that I no longer need because now my software is in the cloud. So, so there, we'll, we'll, well, I'll show you how to do that in a moment. And then the, the last sort of category of the breadcrumbs up at the top here are, are the summary. And you can see this looks a, a lot like uh, some of those uh, uh, driver pages, the, the the benefit drivers, uh, but you'll start to see different kinds of analyses here. Now we're uh, adding up the hours saved, the time and days for reduction to market. Remember I said that uh, time to market is often one of the most important uh, value drivers of the manufacturing company. So you'll see that summarized right here. And you can see it across the, uh, the multiple years. Uh, there are some charts. So at this point, when we're on the uh, on, on the summary page, we're just looking at, at what the system has calculated based on the assumptions that we have put in and, and the uh, formulas that I'll show you that are on each page. And then there, there's a, a nice summary here. You, you, you'll notice that there's a payback period of four months. So, so you're not going to you're going to be in the hole for the first four months. But after that, you can see how the benefits start to add up faster than the costs. OK. There's, there's also uh, some financial numbers here because ultimately uh, this might be considered a, a, a capital project as opposed to operating uh, expenses. And so you'll see an internal rate of return and, and ignore that number right now because like I said, it's only based on the current set of assumptions, which right now are not very balanced. But you, you'll see what the calculations are that are here. There's also a modified internal rate, rate of return. Um, the, the, the internal rate of return, that, that's how much, what percentage would you have to get if you were putting that money into a bank account? What what interest would you have to earn in order to give you the same return as, as what this uh, what the system is doing when it's deployed like this? You can also see here a cost of, uh, or of a three months delay. And I think this is a, a really interesting and kind of important number because what it's saying is, you know, you're actually already solving all of the problems that that you, you've got it, and this is the cost of the way that you're solving them. So this is a sort of a backwards looking uh, number of how much are you spending every three months uh, in order just to do what you're currently doing today. And so this has a lot to say about how, how long you should take to do an evaluation, how long it should take to deploy the system. Uh, you know, every, every, uh, every three months, 
you're spending three hundred thousand dollars, regardless of get, whether you got the system or not. So what you want to do is you, you want to give you want this number to go to zero as the uh, as the system gets deployed. So let's go back to uh, the benefits and, and look at some of these formulas now. So uh, remember, I said, well, if if your system's in the cloud, uh, you might not need all of the hardware that you have, and that's represented by this avoiding costs from displaced systems. So if I'm going to, if I'm currently paying $50,000 for Microsoft Office and I want to get a, a 50% improvement, you know, then with, uh, with the PLM system, uh, you, you would see a, a, an improvement of from $50,000 down to $25,000. And that gets added up year after year. Now, uh, what, what I might want to do is say in the first year, I'm, I'm probably not going to get the full benefit of the system. In fact, if I, if I only uh, you know deploy it in April, I've already lost three of my calendar months, right? So let, let's go calendar year equal fiscal year. Um, and so I might say, I'm only going to get 50% benefit in the first year. I'm only going to get uh, you know 75% uh, in the second year. And I might never reach 100% of, of what I think is possible. So I, this is just a way for me to make the the profile more realistic okay and um, so let's see what what am i missing here about why, why are these not calc dropping to the bottom i'm going to answer that question on a different sheet i think <laughs> but, but what you should see here is you, oh maybe because i turned it i did i turned it off sorry if, there we go if i turn it on now you can see th th these are the benefits in in terms of actual cash flow that you would expect to see in each year. So, yeah, lesson number one, if it's not dropping to the bottom, it's because you have it turned off. Okay, let me go back and then look at the next one. So, so the next one might be reducing the number of change orders. So if a change order costs me $1,000 and I'm currently getting uh, or uh, processing 50 ECOs per year, and if I wanted to make a 25% improvement, it would come this way. Okay, annual growth rate, you'll see that that number was one that I changed back on the key assumptions page. And then here was my profile, I had already edited the, the profile per year. And so it's coming down and, and dropping to these numbers. Now, um, what, you, what you've got on this page, so all of the pages are going to be kind of structured like this. They have uh, descriptions at the top and then these numbers at the bottom. And, and you very quickly, like I kind of fell into the trap just now, is I kind of ignore what the words say because I, I know what they should say. Uh, but, but the first time you go through this, read these value statements and pain points because what they'll do is they'll help form your ideas about uh, how to make the estimates that, that go into the calculation and and just keep you uh, keep you grounded in, in what you're trying to accomplish and this goes on and so i might next look at reducing operating costs here i can uh, re reduce my cost of uh, warranty and returns or cost of manufacturing scrap uh, annual costs of consulting over time you know maybe uh, other annual costs and you can see Again, I've got them lined up. I, I phased them in over time. And, and so here's the value that I would expect to get from that. And you see this number, 200K, that's a little bit, uh, a little bit higher than the others. And, and so that's fine. What you're, gonna, what you're gonna see is that in your business, under your assumptions, you're gonna see different drivers and different metrics produ produce uh, different contributions to the bottom, uh, you know, to the overall, the total benefit. Um, I, I could work on improving win rate, but uh, really what you'll see is that it's more the same. There, there's a there's pain points and value, and then the assumptions are generally listed near the top. Some calculations. What you should also realize it's possible, you know, as sort of an advanced exercise. I won't show it today, but all of these have formulas. Maybe I can illustrate one. Yeah, well, it's not a great one because it just says, well, that value is equal to H10 or H1. Let me try a different one. Okay, here. So it looks kind of like a spreadsheet formula, and so all of this math can be can be changed over time. You know, just with uh, done within the system, and so you should know that that's possible. 
But what we've done is, is we've simplified it as much as possible and we've focused on those four main drivers and the three to, to, to six uh, metrics that, that characterize those drivers. And so if you stay just on the, on the pages as I'm showing you today, uh, you're kind of taking the best advantage of the model that we've already built. But just know that the system is capable of other models as well. Moving on, we'll see just more of the same. And I don't think I probably have to click on every page to so convince you of that. But uh, you know, if there are interesting ones, we could come back to them and, and, and look more at them. Uh, I just want to uh, spend enough time on each page that you can kind of get an idea of the types of metrics that we're measuring and trying to manipulate here to get to our, uh, our, our best estimate. So this is the, uh, these are the, uh, the metrics for operational efficiency. And, and then if I turn, turn this back on, we'll see that there's some contribution from product creation. And, and here are the two metrics that are contributing to it. <laughs> Excuse me. So, so we've put, uh, you know, we've put some energy and, and uh, a lot of work into trying to optimize this set of sheets. It, it's just a smart document is all it is. Uh, where you enter your assumptions and what falls out of the model are, are the, the numbers across the top here. And with that, I think I'm going to put this down and move forward here, one page, and, and talk about, okay, so where could, you, where could you go from here? I mean, you, you start by identifying your product development challenges. And, and I would encourage you to think about, you know, it's probably not the first time you've thought about your challenges. So what have you tried in the past? How, how well has that worked? Because if you think about those two things, uh, th th those are gonna help you figure out what uh, metrics and, and uh, you know, what specific value drivers, you will have uh, some framework for going into that document. Uh, but you, you can do all of these uh, first four bullets on, on your own. And then if you call uh, your uh, account team at Hagerman, uh, they'd be happy to actually introduce you into the tool that I was just using that I, that I showed you and help you fo focus on your business outcomes, develop a strategy that, that can sustain you for a long time, but be uh, cost effective to implement uh, uh, immediately or in the short term. And then, you know, at some point you start collecting the data that you need to document the, your justification and you can collaborate with your account team uh, on that justification and uh, pass it around to your stakeholders. You use that to uh, to introduce them to the savings and the real value that you get from a PLM system. 